Well, thanks for having me. Uh, the question of the problem of evil is the question that I fear most. So when I see fear most, let me put this in context for you, okay? Um, I've been giving apologetics talks for about 24 years, um, and I have faced some hostile questioning after some of those talks. Um, and so, you know, in, in uh, various different, different venues, I'm, I'm used to people asking questions, and, and uh, sometimes the, you know, the question asker uh, uh, can, can get a little aggressive. Now, that's in the apologetics world, but also in my field of uh, theoretical physics, uh, the area in which I did my dissertation um, is uh, a very, very hotly contested field. It actually still is. And so, in fact, I've also faced a lot of hostile question askers um, at the end of my, my research talks as well. So I suppose either, either by now I'm, I'm either you know, comfortable with it or just numb. I'm not entirely sure. But I'm going to tell you about today the question that I fear the most. And that is the question of how in the world can a good and loving God allow evil? Now, the reason this is such a scary question to me is because this is never an intellectual question. It just isn't. Um, this is always a question from a wounded heart. It's always a question that's driven by something bad happened to me or something bad happened to my loved one. Um, and always in the context of, of a room full of people, there are always also other people there present who have had some serious evil done to them. So we have to be extremely delicate. This is the one question that comes up in apologetics that really, in my opinion, requires the most care um, and the most gentleness um, in order to, to give, um, I'm not going to say a complete answer, uh, but in order to give some reason for the hope that's in us. And so because of the delicacy of the question, I always um, rephrase it in my mind. Rather than phrasing it as an intellectual question, how can a good and loving God allow evil, I rephrase it into a personal question. Something along the lines of, you know, something, something serious, you know, something like my baby sister was murdered last night. How is your God a good God? Okay, so I just always repersonalize it. And you know, if you were talking with a friend or with a loved one who had genuinely experienced that recently and, and the wounds were still raw, you would never dive right in to, and you, you would not give them, you know, the top five intellectual arguments for why that's compatible with the existence of God. That would be cruel to start with that. Um, you would just sit and spend some time grieving with your friend over the atrocity that they had um, experienced. So I just, you know, I encourage you, um, uh, in thinking about how to address this question with our seeker friends, um, and, and even with Christians who have struggled with it or are still struggling with it, I still struggle with it, um, to remember the compassion, remember these are real stories that happen to, to real people, and that it's really never a, a purely intellectual question. So for the purposes of today's discussion, let me define evil as moral evil. I'm going to focus on moral evil, not on, say, uh, suffering that just happens as a, as a natural consequence of natural physical laws, but I really want to tackle moral evil. So let me define that as one moral entity, such as a human, selfishly harms another moral entity. Or another way to phrase this would be that evil is bad decisions by people that disrespect God himself or disrespect the image of God that he has placed in his people. And uh, now, of course, we're encouraged in the scriptures by, by the Apostle Peter to always be ready to give an answer when someone asks us about our hope. Um, and so, you know, if you have read a lot in apologetics or participated a lot in that community, you're familiar with some of the, the, the main logical arguments concerning that. I don't want to focus on that today. I'll just briefly review it a little bit, but then I want to get in, into a little bit more of... Um, of the good news, because you know the title of this talk is the good news about the problem of evil, and the reason I want the good news is in there is because I do believe that the good news of Christ is big enough for this one too, and his his hope really is good news. So some of the familiar arguments about how it's compatible that a good and loving God would allow evil. Um, to quote William Lane Craig, he makes the point that so long as it's even possible that God has some morally sufficient reason for permitting evil, it follows that God and the presence of evil are, are logically consistent. It's not an outright um, contradiction. Um, now, another thing we want to take into account is that 
um, the, the presence of evil among us, by which I mean bad moral decisions that hurt other people or hurt God, really they always all hurt both, right? They always hurt God and people, um, is to just ask the question. Just think about what does God value? Does he, which does he value more? Does he value more our freedom or our obedience? And just, just sort of asking that question, I think, clarifies things a lot. Does God allow, does God, um, does God uh, value our freedom more or our obedience more? And you can see from how he set up the world that he, although he highly values our obedience, he actually values our freedom more. And that, that blows my mind, right? And um, when I take into account uh, the fact that he, he apparently values our freedom more than our obedience, then I have to remember that he's given me freedom, which means if he's really given me freedom, he's given me freedom to, to hurt other people. As much as uh, I don't really want to do that, I do have that, that freedom to do that. And uh, you know, but why? why? Why this emphasis on freedom, right? So we can ask a, a related question, which is, which of, which of these does God value more? Does he value our love or our obedience more? And so when we look at it through that lens, does he value our obedience more or our love? Um, we can see that he values our, our love more. And so you know, one of the reasons he's going to need to give us freedom is so that we have true capacity to love. Um, and when we have true capacity to love, it means we've got freedom. When we've got freedom, it means we've got freedom to do wrong things, things that he doesn't approve of and things that are bad for us and bad for um, other people. Now, um, sometimes the direction that uh, Christian apologetic arguments go in regard to evil are along the lines of, okay, who's, uh, from what worldview is the question being asked, right? is the question of the problem of evil being asked perhaps from an atheist worldview. And a, a very um, a common line of reasoning there is to talk about how um, from the atheist worldview, it's very difficult to even define evil. Um, I think that that's, um, that's a good and fine argument. I think it's, it's even um, logically correct. On the other hand, I know plenty of atheists who don't actually see that as a contradiction. So from within their, their worldview, they don't actually see it as a problem. It's just sort of a heads up, right? That um, while it's not uh, natural to be able to define evil from, from an atheistic point of view, it's actually not an outright contradiction. Um, I certainly know atheists who still hold to the principle that humans are, are equally valuable, um, even though that doesn't, you know, obviously flow out of atheism, it's not a direct contradiction, right? So that's just a, just a heads up that um, atheists also do, do believe that there is such a thing as moral evil. Um, sometimes people will wonder, okay, um, can you, does the fact that there are shades of gray mean that this, this really is too hard to define, it's too hard to define evil, so how can we even talk about it? But I would argue that even in cases of shades of gray, um, you can still identify black and white. I have a piece of paper right here with my speaking notes on it that's printed in grayscale, okay? And yet, you can clearly identify certain regions on it that are black and certain regions that are white. So we can still make distinctions even, even if there are degrees and that sort of thing. Um, and so, you know, for example, I've never, uh, even though different cultures might draw the line between good and evil in different places, every culture has those lines, and there are certain things that remain black in every culture, just universally, you know. So, for example, would it ever in any culture be okay for an adult to purposefully blind a child for fun or for profit? You know, there's, there's just no culture that says, hey, yeah, that's a good value. That's our value. We want to stand up for that. That's, that's wrong. It's so black. It's considered black by every culture. Um, and yet I, I have a friend who that is, um, that is what happened to him when he was uh, about two years old. His parents purposefully blinded him so that they could make more money begging. It's just wrong, it's just evil, right? And a good worldview is gonna have an, an answer for that. Uh, you know, the flip side of this is that uh, there's so much evil in the world, at least the way I see it. When I look out in the world, I don't know about you, but I look at it and I say, this world is not right. There's something wrong, you know? There's, there's too much evil. This world is not the way it should be. It should be better, we want it to be better. Um, and I see more evil in the world than I think is reasonable under a purely naturalistic scenario. 
So I think the level of evil that humans express uh, points actually to our spiritual nature and to the, to the presence of spiritual forces that are even beyond uh, us. So though that's a very brief summary of some of the intellectual um, considerations um, about how is it possible that a good and loving God uh, could allow evil in the world and how do, how do Christians think about that? Um, but the big question is, does that give hope to the hurting heart who asked the question or does it give hope to the hurting person who heard the question or who will, who will hear what answer we give. And so the rest of Peter's advice is this. Peter does say in 1 Peter 3, always be ready to give an answer when someone asks you about your hope. And he goes on to say, give a kind and respectful answer. So it's, it's the kindness um, that I think will make a huge difference for the sake of people who have really experienced some, some really awful stuff. And um, as, as, uh, as Tim Keller Puts it, uh, the theism has more tools than, say, an atheistic worldview for dealing with suffering. Okay, so we do have more tools in, in, in a worldview that, it, that incorporates God. There's hope. And why is that? It's because our God really is a God of hope. Um, our God is greater than evil, so much greater than evil. And in fact, he's, he's in the business of conquering it. So in, in the words of Gary Haugen, um, anybody out there heard of Gary Haugen, he's founder of the International Justice Mission. An International Justice Mission um, works on a lot of different issues of justice. Some of what they do is set slaves free and prosecute the slave owners and slave trainers. Uh, part of what they do is prosecute instances of, of violence in cases where the public justice, justice system has failed the, uh, the person, the victim. Um, and so Gary Haugen has this to say about it. He says, the good news about injustice is that God is against it. <laughs> and so uh, I just want us to take that to heart, that the good news, there is good news here. The good news about evil is that God is against us. I'm sorry, is that God is against, uh, against evil. Why? It's because evil really is bad. <laughs> so one of the things I want to be super careful with in thinking about uh, the logical questions of a good God and the presence of evil in our, our world is to be super careful that we always, always, always uh, remember that evil really is bad. <laughs> it's it's uh, be super careful that if you give an intellectual argument about that, that uh, you don't borderline start saying that evil isn't that bad or that it's good for you or something like that. No, no, evil is bad. Let's just can we just agree on that? That evil evil is bad. So the good news about what God is doing in this world is that God has a plan for this. He doesn't just leave us hanging. He doesn't leave us where we are. Um, our Lord has a complete plan for rescuing us from evil in every way that we need it, okay? So he rescues me from the evil that I do. That's the cross. That's the work that Jesus does on the cross to rescue me from the bad things that I've done to other people. But he also has a plan for rescuing me from the evil that's been done to me. And that actually is, is judgment day. Part of it, anyway, is judgment day. Um, and so how is that good news? You may not be used to thinking of Judgment Day as good news. But let me tell you a little bit. Let's just uh, think a little bit about what Judgment Day is, is like through the eyes of the oppressed, through the eyes of someone who really is powerless and has had uh, awful things done to them. Um, you know, the, the message of Judgment Day in that case is that you are made in the image of God. Uh, Every evil act that happened to you was wrong, and a day is coming when your God will rise up and defend you because you are worth defending. Now, imagine what it would be like to, um, to be in a context where you really are powerless. Um, even today, even in, in, in the modern world, uh, slavery is a big business. Uh, it's really hard to get good numbers on this, but the International Justice Mission estimates that uh, the slave trade today is about a $50 billion a year business. Um, it's, it's crazy. There are more people enslaved today than were ever taken in 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade. It's a serious, awful problem. It's not legal anywhere. This is part of what International Justice Mission does. They're on a mission to end slavery for good because our generation uh, can do that. But picture what this part of the good news looks like if you were a slave. So if you were born a slave, you mistreated your whole life, you die at the hands of your oppressor. From that perspective, would 
Judgment Day be good news to you? I think so. I think if you are somebody who's grown up a slave, the good news that a day is coming when your God will rise up and defend you is very, very good news. Um, and if we look back over the history of how has God revealed himself to us, historically speaking, um, to completely oversimplify the Bible, allow me to do it, um, Old Testament, justice. New Testament, mercy. Okay, so the way God reveals himself in the Old Testament, a lot of what's going on there is, is justice, his heart for justice. And, of course, in the New Testament, we have the grace uh, side of things, the seeds of the grace, and, and in truth, all of the grace was already present there in the Old Testament. But, uh, but the major revelations are justice and then mercy. And um, so, so historically speaking, God, having revealed first his heart for, mer for uh, justice, I consider that to be the first half of the gospel. Because again, if I, if I look at um, the gospel as God's good news for rescuing humanity from evil, he does need to rescue me from both, right? He needs to rescue me from the evil I've done. He also needs to rescue me from the evil that's been done to me. And Judgment Day is a big part of that. So let me just um, whirlwind fast here, review a little bit of what's in the Old Testament about God's plan to conquer evil. Uh, in Psalm 67, the psalmist has this to say, let the nations be glad, let the nations sing for joy, because you, God, will judge the peoples with uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. So the psalmist felt like the judgment of God um, was in fact good news. It was cause to sing and be glad with joy, because again, it is the day when our God will rise up and defend us. Um, I'm going to read a lot of Psalm 10 here. Psalm 10 is uh, the basis for Gary Haugen's book called Terrify No More because of how this psalm ends. But this is a psalm. The psalmist is crying out um, against the evil things that happen to people. I'm probably going to cry as I read this. I usually do. Um, so just heads up. And so, so the psalmist cries out, proud and brutal people hunt down the poor. They crouch down and they wait to grab a victim and they say, God can't see. He's got on a blindfold. So do something, God. Use your powerful arm to help those in need. The wicked, they don't respect you. In their hearts, they say, God's not going to punish us. But you, God, you see the trouble. You see the distress. You will do something. The poor can count on you. So can orphans. Now, break the arms of all the merciless pe people. Punish them for doing wrong and make them stop. Our Lord, you will always rule, but nations will vanish from the earth. You listen to the longings of those who suffer. You offer them hope and you pay attention to their cries for help. You defend the orphans and you defend everyone else in need so that no one on earth can terrify others again. That's hope, right? That's a real hope for people who have had evil done to them, that a day is coming when our God will rise up and defend us. If you do a word study of salvation in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms, just uh, use any of your electronic tracking tools today and poke that word salvation and see what, see what that gives you in the Psalms. Salvation in the Psalms is always about rescue from oppression. It's sometimes also about forgiveness, Okay, because that idea is absolutely in the Old Testament. But every time salvation comes up in the Psalms, salvation is rescue from oppression. And you may remember that the Hebrew word uh, there I'm talking about salvation is Yeshua. Is that a familiar sounding name to Christians? Yeshua. It's very, very close to Jesus' name, uh, Joshua. Um, and so, you know, the, the prophecies of the Messiah also are that the Messiah sets captives free. The Messiah rescues the oppressed. The Messiah hears the cries of the brokenhearted and he redeems and he restores. He sets the captives free. For example, Isaiah 52 describes the good news of the Messiah as including rescue from oppression. Uh, in verse 10, Isaiah says in, in chapter 52, the Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. And that's the word Yeshua. That's the salvation is to rescue from oppression. Um, 
It may surprise you to hear that the New Testament writers also, in some of their encapsulations of the gospel, every once in a while in the New Testament, you'll find kind of a short, pithy statement of the gospel. A lot of those are creeds. Uh, I'm going to read for you three today where the encapsulation actually includes Judgment Day as part of the good news. So here's how... Um, Here's how Peter says it in Acts 10. He says, God ordered us, he's talking about Jesus, Jesus ordered us to preach to the people and to solemnly testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. But according to, to Peter, um, Jesus wanted them to preach not, not just the rescue in the form of forgiveness, but that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Peter includes that in his encapsulation of the gospel. Paul includes it again in uh, the Sermon on Mars Hill. He says, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent because, why? Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So Paul includes this idea of just judgment in, in the gospel. Um, in Romans 2, Paul makes it extremely um, short and pithy. He says, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. That's one of his encapsulations of the gospel, that God will judge through, um, through Christ Jesus. And to me, that statement of the gospel gives tremendous hope for every part of evil that I need rescuing from, right? So I do need rescuing from the evil that's been done to me. It's very good news that my God will rise up and defend me. Um, I also need rescuing from the evil that I've done. And so it is also very good news that the one who will judge me is Christ himself. And his heart for us, this is the same Christ who, when he was hanging on a cross and being tortured to death, he, his heart is, Father, forgive them. They don't realize what they're doing. So I think it's very, very good news that this is, this is the one who'll judge us. Um, so the good, so that, is, uh, that is the good news. The good news about the problem of evil um, is that God rescues us from evil in every way that we need it because humanity needs rescue from this problem of evil. Now, there's a little bit of a counterpoint also given um, in Romans 8, 28. Perhaps that verse already occurred to you. Uh, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Um, that's a verse that's often uh, quoted in the context of how do we reconcile a good and loving God with the presence of evil. I want to caution you to be super careful with this verse, okay? Um, the Bible instructs us to um, you know, rejoice with those who rejoice, but weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. So if someone's still in, uh, in the process of, of feeling the tremendous emotions that come along when they've had serious evil done to them, they may not be ready for that verse. Just use it with caution. What we really want to be very careful of is to not tell the sufferer that God let this happen to you for your own good. In fact, I don't think that's biblical. I don't see an example of God um, allowing evil to happen to someone for their own good. I, I want to be super clear that evil is bad. That's why, <laughs> you know, evil is so bad that every time we do an evil act to another human being, we incur the death penalty. Why do I incur the death penalty, right? It's because every person is made in the image of God. And, and Jesus himself said, I take it personally, right? Remember, Jesus is our judge at the end of the age. And he says, Whatever you've done to my little sister or what are you, whatever you've done to my little brother, you did it to me. I take it personally. So that's why we incur uh, the death penalty when we do bad things. It's because the evil really is, uh, really is bad. So we don't want to tell, we don't want to give any uh, false impression to someone who's suffering that perhaps God let it happen for their own good. Be, be super careful of, of that. Um, and in fact, Paul himself exposes this line of reasoning uh, to say that, uh, you know, Paul, Paul has this to say, um, why not say as we, this is in Romans 3, verse 8, why not say as we are slanderously reporting, we being the apostles, as we're slander, slanderously reported and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. He goes on to say their condemnation is just. He's, he's throwing out that argument as invalid, as not a good line of reasoning. So let us do evil that good may come is not a good 
um, is not a valid line of, line of reasoning according to Paul. So if it's not valid for us, it's also not a valid line of reasoning for God. So I don't, I don't think that when evil happens to us, it's, it's that we should ever say that, um, that, that the evil is for our good, the evil's not for our good. His redemption is for our good and his goodness and his greatness to overcome the evil and to be far more powerful than the evil. That's the good part and that's the good news. Um, but the hope is that our God is a big, great, and awesome God. He always gives back more than was lost. He always restores more than was taken away. That's, that's who he is. Um, we have another picture. We have a few pictures of what it's like for righteous characters in the Bible to, to have evil done to them. Um, you know, our, our Savior, our Lord and Savior Jesus, had serious evil done to him. He allowed himself, even though he was all-powerful, knowing he had all-powerful, knowing that he had all power, but in order to show the world that he's obedient to the Father, he allowed himself to be tortured to death. He allowed himself to have evil done to him. Now, if I think about that, right? Yes, God the Father had a great, great, great purposes in letting Jesus suffer and in letting Jesus experience evil. But if I look at, at what, you know, what was the higher purpose, um, it wasn't actually for Jesus good to have that evil done to him. Okay, it was actually for, for the benefit of, of everyone else. It was for the benefit of the people that he's saving. We have another um, similar picture, um, a, a Christ um, a looking ahead to Christ, a type of Christ, uh, several of those in the Old Testament, but a good example is Joseph. You remember the story of Joseph, how um, Joseph, the littlest brother at the time, was sold into slavery by his brothers. That's bad. Can we agree? Being sold into slavery is bad. And so the story goes that um, Joseph's brothers betray him. They sell him into slavery. He's taken captive. He's traded over to Egypt where he becomes a slave. While he's a slave, even though God blesses him, he works his way up. He becomes second in command in the household. He's falsely accused, and he goes to prison on a false accusation. So this is someone who's experienced evil after evil, not just the evil of being a of, the evil of being done to him, of him being a slave, but the evil done to him of a false accusation, and then rotting in prison for years, waiting to be released. Um, now, God is watching over him and redeems him out of the situation, and he then becomes second in command in Egypt. And um, when he encounters his brothers again, and when he finally reveals to his brothers who he is, not only is there a lot of emotion, jo Joseph is so overwhelmed with emotion and sobbing that he has to leave the room and still everyone can hear it. This is a very, very emotional moment for Joseph to confront his brothers again. Um, but he also tells them, um, essentially, um, don't beat yourselves up over what happened. You know, he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to save all these people. Okay, that's how it goes on to say it. Uh, that's in um, Genesis 50, where, uh, where Joseph is, is cognizant of the fact that bad things happen to him, but that the, the bad things that happened to him were used for the good of many, many, many people. Because <clears throat> I don't think there's a context in which it was good for Joseph to be a slave. I don't think it was good for Joseph to be falsely accused. These are bad things. The people who did that to him will have to answer for it on Judgment Day. But but God is greater than the evil that humans do, right? God's power exceeds our power. His power to restore exceeds our power to do evil. And so what happens in Joseph's life is that God works amazing things, promotes Joseph to second in command and he does, of, of Egypt, and he does it in order to rescue others. I don't think the circumstances were ever in any way good for Joseph. I mean, does, does becoming the second most powerful in your company in your country, does that really properly compensate for having been sold into slavery and been a slave all those years, subject to violence as a slave? That's how slaves are controlled, is through violence. Does that compensate for Joseph having been falsely accused and rotted in prison while people forgot about him? I don't think it compensates for that at all. But Joseph, Joseph didn't say that. He didn't say you know, it, it, that, that it was good for him. He said it was good for all these people to save them. Joseph saw the larger picture of what God had done through him. And, and if I think about what was it like for the people of Egypt, right? Not only did Joseph's, um, did the things that happened to Joseph end up helping them because he saved them from the famine, but think about what it was like in Egypt you know, was it good for the people of Egypt that their ruler, that their prime minister 
had been a slave. Was that good for the people of Egypt? Was it good for the people of Egypt that their ruler had suffered under a false accusation and rotted in a prison for years waiting to be set free from it? I think it was very good for the people of Egypt that their, that their second in command um, had seen the injustices that the, that the Egyptian uh, system was doing to people. I, I, I hope that, um, um, I have every confidence that Joseph worked to redeem that system and to make it better for the people of Egypt because of what he had experienced. So, so to recap, uh, I want to make sure that um, in thinking about what it's like when our, our friends, our seeker friends, our atheist friends, or maybe in, in the context of, of public cases, people question us about how is it possible that a good and loving God could allow evil. I just want to, just to recap, please remember it's always a question from a wounded heart. Um, please keep in mind uh, to be sensitive to the people around us who have experienced real evil. Um, and always hold that line that evil is bad, period, it's not good. Um, but that there is good news about it. The good news about the problem of evil is that God is a against it. And the hopeful answer that we can give as Christians is that he always restores more than was lost. He always give back, gives back more than was taken away. And he is able to save us from evil in every way that we need it. He saves us not just from the evil that we do, which is the cross, but he also saves us from the evil that's been done to us, not just through defending us on judgment day, but he also is able to pour redemption into our hearts so much that he's able to, to restore um, to restore us from that pain as well and to return us back to joy.